Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is David Shepard. I am the interpretive specialist here at Fort William Historical Park. Uh, we are located on the shores of the Kamenesqua River, uh, we, and we mainly interpret 18, the fur trade in 1816, as well as through to the merger of the Hudson Bay Company as well and the Northwest Company. I'd like to start off uh, today before I jump in with the land acknowledgement. I'd like to acknowledge the Fort, that Fort William Historical Park and myself reside in the land, the traditional lands of the Fort William First Nations and the other signatures of the Robinson Treaty of 1850. If it wasn't for their help and with what we do, uh, we wouldn't be able to uh, provide the programming that we do. So Fort William covers a wide area across the fur trade, but one of the key people that I was asked to talk about today was Dr. John McLaughlin. He's an absolutely fascinating uh, individual. In fact, I'm actually dressed up today in my interpreting outfit as Dr. John McLaughlin including the hat as well, which you can't really see as well as I had hoped. Um, unfortunately, due to COVID, I wasn't able to do this in our uh, the, the apothecary where I had hoped, but hopefully um, the picture will do justice to where we are. So I was asked by Dale, as well as Tom, to talk about Dr. John McLaughlin. Uh, the 1821 merger and of course some of the other research facilities that we have at Fort William Historical Park. So I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. Hopefully everybody can see that. Getting the nod from Kelsey, so that, I think that means we're good to go. So during the presentation today, I'm gonna to pause in a couple points to do a little bit of interpreting as Dr. John McLaughlin, as well as to take a couple of your questions as we move through. I would really like to thank my colleagues at Fort William Historical Park for helping me. Uh, my colleagues, uh, Elliot Comrardi, Victoria Hill, uh, John Reed, they were great sources of information and also they kind of helped to keep me on track because uh, they kind of kept telling me that 200 slides might be a little bit much on Dr. John McLaughlin for, for this time frame. So I was able to narrow it down. So as I like to say, Dr. John McLaughlin started from a very humble beginning and then he went all the way on to be the father of Oregon. So today I'll be exploring Dr. John McLaughlin, the 1821 merger between the Hudson Bay Company as the Northwest Company, and I'll also be looking at what we have at Fort William Historical Park. So for today's journey, as I said, um, I'm going to be starting off with uh, key places and definitions just to kind of put, help put everything in concepts. These are things I struggled with myself when I jumped into this topic uh, many years ago when I was learning about the doctor, um, different terms, different, uh, different acronyms that were used, and as well as the differences between the different companies. Then exploring the life and times of Dr. John McLaughlin and his love for his wife, Marguerite McLaughlin. Then moving on to the 1821 merger. And then of course, what we have at Fort William Historical Park, or hopefully everyone will get a chance to come. And I was really looking forward to having the group with us this year. Unfortunately, COVID had different ideas. We were gonna do a very large beaver club and wine and dine and toast everyone. But maybe we can do that next year. And, and at the end, I'll have a few minutes to take some questions and hopefully provide a few answers in the, in the meantime. So just to kind of put everything in preference, the Northwest Company uh, was really a fur trading company that was an amalgamation of very small companies such as McTavish and Company, uh, uh, Alexander McKenzie and Company, and it was established in 1778 and ran until 1821 when the merger happened with the Hudson Bay Company. The Hudson Bay Company had a royal charter under the Rupert's Land Proclamation, and it was, tra and it was founded in 1670. It was based in London, England during this time, as we know that there is a new version of the Hudson Bay Company that is out there today. Um, and during our talk, uh, everything that happens with the merger happens over in London, England. A marriage uh, façon de pays. It is a marriage in the custom of the land. This was quite common within the fur trade and is very important within the doctor's life because he actually had two marriages out of Fasson de Pays, one to an Ojibwe woman and uh, one as well to Margaret McLaughlin who he later marries. Um, the company, the Northwest Company, actually provided many items for the families as well as helped to support the families. A wintering partner within the Northwest Company was somebody such as myself, Dr. John McLaughlin, who owned shares in the company, and we were able to take a percentage of the profits left at the end of the year. An agent within the Northwest Company, somebody who has shares within the company, such as William McGilvery, Simon McGilvery, 
Um, and the difference between them is not only did they get a share in the profits, but before the profits were divided out, they also got, were paid commission for doing work within the company, therefore making their making it so that there was less profits for the actual company for the wintering partners to share in. So they're effectively skimming off the top. Uh, this caused quite a bit of strife within the company and the doctor and his relationship with the McGilveries, which will come into play more with the merger of 1821. Of course, then we have the Pemmican Proclamation, which was uh, issued by Miles McDonnell, which was designed in 1814 to starve out the Métis around the Red River Colony and near Seven Oaks, as well as to stop all fur trading within the Northwest Company from going west to east. This plays a vital role in the siege of Fort William, as well as the Battle of Seven Oaks. And then, of course, we have the 1821 merger, where both companies on the verge of being bankrupt were ordered by the courts to merge and this led to actually a better life for the doctor as he moved on so starting off i i've yet to find a, a picture of dr john mclaughlin while he's smiling and i have to tell my interpreters every single year that it's okay to smile as the doctor i'm pretty sure he smiled but every picture every statue he has this very stern look on his face he was a very driven man um, trying to make himself better the love for his life and his many children was quite apparent, and he did quite well within the business. So, Riviere de Lue to Oregon. So, on the map that you can see here, you can see that this is British North America, and we have Riviere de Lue on the East Coast. Fort William, where I happen to be sitting right now, um, in my apothecary, was the inland headquarters of the Northwest Company from 1805 until basically 1821, and the doctor took over in 1816. Then, of course, we have Rainy Lake House, which is, of course, quite, quite important with the book that everyone has, which is not showing up because it's green. I just realized that. Uh, and that's where the doctor met Stephen Harmon Long, as well as John Tanner. Then, of course, the end of his life during this part of the adventure, where I'm going to quickly talk about his life in Fort Astoria, um, which was formerly Fort George, which he helped to form the, um, the town, the city of Oregon. So, of course, then we have Rainy Lake, Lake of the Woods area, which is now Fort Francis, and you can see where Fort William is, and this is Lac de Pluie district, or the Rainy Lake district. This is very important within the indigenous people of the area, for Lac de Pluie is the area where a lot, where they harvest Nenomen, the wild rice, which was actually traded heavily within the company. Um, also, Nenomen was actually brought in from Lac de Croix. Uh, from um, the Anishinaabe in that area as well, as well as Flint. Flint was not brought in. Flint was also one of the uh, one of the few trade items which were brought in. So as you can see here is Rainy Lake, the Voyager route, and that arrow indicates where he met. Now, it was in 1823 when the three famous people met that we all have been studying in our book, where we have Stephen Harmon Long, as well as John Tanner, met on those fateful couple days while Dr. John McLaughlin was providing medical assistance to John Tanner. And of course, over here, we have the Pacific Ocean, we have Fort Astoria and Fort George, which then later would come on when, uh, which was becomes majorly important when he is a chief factor within the actual company itself. Now, a really interesting thing is Dr. John McLaughlin is connected to this area, not once, but actually twice. The reason why is I will get into more uh, when we start talking about Margaret McLaughlin, her son, Thomas, and in her former husband, Ala, Ala, Marge Ala Fasson de Pays, uh, Alexander McKay. So his time throughout his life was quite adventurous as a doctor. Um, so starting off, of course, in 1784, the doctor was born in Riviere de Lou. Uh, from there on the East Coast, he actually moved down to Montreal, where he started his apprenticeship with uh, Dr. James Fisher, uh, not to be uh, not to be um, confused with Mr. Fisher, who was a clerk at Fort William during his time um, in 1816, um, and this basically went on until for three years. He was age 14. Could you imagine having a doctor only apprentice for three years? Chef Hans, who worked for the company as the chef for the McGilveries, had to apprentice for nine years to be a chef. A little disproportionate right there. Someone to cook you food. Nine years of apprenticing versus a surgeon who only had to have three years. But the doctor was really well known in his practice of the humoral theory, which was the uh, prevalent medical 
medicine being offered at the time. And he's really well known and a great surgeon. So in 1803, he then receives his license in Montreal uh, and then signs on a five year contract with the Northwest Company. He actually formed the deal with Mr. McTavish, who Simon McTavish, known as the Marquis, who was the founder of the Northwest Company in 1778. He had originally agreed to be paid about two to 300 pounds per year, but unfortunately the contract only went to 100 pounds per year. He decided not to argue this because he was helping his brother David go through medical school, uh, school at the time in Edinburgh. So he decided it was better to take a little bit of a hit and also have the help of the company. 1808 to 1809, um, his son Joseph McLaughlin is born. We're not really 100% sure of the year, as the records are a little scant on this. He did marry, and uh, sorry, he did, he did have a custom of the land marriage, a marriage à la façon de pays with an Ojibwe woman. Unfortunately, there's no name attached to this. We're not sure. We know that she existed, but we're unfortunately unsure of who she actually was. Um, and this lasted for about a year. Uh, and the records don't really indicate if, the, if she actually passed away during childbirth or they just basically decided to go their way. A marriage à la façon de pays um, doesn't end in a divorce. It basically ends in a casting off or two, two areas where they just decide that we really just, this isn't working for us and that they just basically go their separate ways. In 1811, John uh, enter, enters into another marriage with Marguerite McLaughlin, who met during a rendezvous. Um, she, Margaret McKay, um, at the time, where originally Wadden, was born in 1775, and her husband, Alexander McKay, had recently passed away, um, and they had actually split in 1810. I'll get into this a little bit later. Um, and she, then he adopts her four children. So right now, we know that he has five children, um, and he is now, he's, he's a very large family man, and he loves, and he loves the children. And he, and he deeply loves Margaret McLaughlin, and actually defends her honor vigorously throughout his life. Um, in 1812, um, John McLaughlin Jr. is born, um, and at this time he was actually in uh, moving to the Rainy Lake area. Uh, in 1814, McLaughlin becomes partner in the, within the Northwest Company, which he's been trying to for several years. His pay is actually raised to about two to three hundred pounds per year. Uh, at this point, he has also moved to be the proprietor as well as the district commander. Uh, for the Rainy Lake uh, area, so Lac de Pluie. Uh, in 1814, his uh, Mary McLaughlin has another daughter, uh, as Mary Elizabeth McLaughlin is born, uh, and some of these uh, children actually go on to be quite prevalent by uh, marrying into other chief factors as well as cargo captains. In 1815, after bitter feuding with the other wintering partners, Dr. John McLaughlin convinces the board um, to make Alexander, Mc, sorry, Kenneth McKenzie, there's a lot, there's a lot of mix in the, in the company, a, um, a, a, a agent, so moving him back to Montreal um, as a Montreal agent, which then frees him up to take over um, Fort William, which is the inland headquarters of um, the Northwest Company. So the inland headquarters of the Northwest Company is Fort William because we're roughly, and I'm going to do air quotes here, roughly about halfway in the entire supply chain. The, North, the Hudson Bay Company had its shipping facilities up on the Hudson Bay where we couldn't do that as a company in 1816. So I say we as in doctor, sometimes we slip back and forth between first person and third person. Sorry about that. And so what was decided that, that Fort William would be its inland headquarters after it moved up from the Grand Portage uh, area where many people uh, in upper Minnesota um, no, like Grand Portage, and it's re and it's a uh, recreated uh, historical fort that used to be the in the land headquarters until 1803, when then it was actually moved up onto the British side of the border in 1805. Now the doctor took this over by basically threatening to quit as the only doctor. He knew he had the leverage, so he basically said, "If you don't give it to me, I'm out." So they made him the proprietor of Fort William, the inland headquarters. Um, unfortunately, the next year he was arrested. He was arrested with the other partners in 1806, uh, 1816 by Lord Selkirk and his regiment of Demiron soldiers, basically a paid mercenary force um, and during the summer of 1816. So uh, we've recently just went through the 200 year anniversary of that. And as you know, we are in the 200 anniversary of the merger of 1821, 1817, uh, Eliza is born. Um, and then 1821, the doctor, fearful of what will happen between if the if the two companies are, are negotiated, 
Um, and it's only the agents who are talking. So he actually leads a delegate of wintering partners over to negotiate with the Hudson Bay. Um, they are somewhat successful with this. Unfortunately, they sided more with the agents, but, uh, but the deal actually worked out better for many of the wintering partners because due to nepotism within the Northwest company, they were unable to move up. Whereas with the Hudson Bay company, they became chief factors, uh, board of directors because they knew how the fur trade ran on the, gr on, on the ground. 1823, um, his paths then cross with, uh, with uh, Stephen Harmon Long as well as John Tanner in Lac de Pluie, where he is the, um, where he's in charge of the district. 1824, he's then transferred over to Fort George, formerly Fort Astoria, um, and then he is now in charge of the Pacific Coast Trade. He is actually credited with getting a lot of the area mapped as well as looking further into building relationships with the Indigenous people. Dr. John McLaughlin did a lot with the Indigenous people as of his wife, his two wives actually, his, his original wife and as well as Marguerite were both uh, Indigenous and he took a lot of that um, and he fought for a lot of rights within the Indigenous communities as well, especially with trading as well as the movement of people and the development of the Métis. 1824 to 1816, he moves his company, the, the Hudson Bay Company headquartered to Fort Vancouver in charge of, and then is in charge of the entire Columbia District and in 29 develops, uh, sorry, founds Oregon City. Uh, he then retires in 46 and he retires so the Hudson Bay Company becomes an American citizen. Um, he felt strongly that the American government uh, should be in that area and he wanted to help out so he actually formed a store when he retired and he was at the very end of the Oregon Trail which many of us have heard about and he was the, the last stopping place. People could get supplies, fix items that were broken and would actually just go to actually hear Dr. John McLaughlin talk about his experiences and life and stories in the fur trade itself. Now, in 1875, um, unfortunately, in September, he passes away. Uh, unfortunately, he wasn't a bitter man at this point. For after 46, the Americans started to think he was actually a British spy and had connections to the crown because he had he was originally a British citizen from the colonies. He had worked within the British North America. He had also worked within two British companies. And then he was coming in and basically founding the area. So they confiscated his land, his sawmill, his store, um, and most of his money. Now, he did uh, pass away with his loving wife, Marguerite, next to him. Uh, unfortunately, he was very embittered, and he complained about the injustices that were done with him, to him. And one final note. He also complained until the very day that he died about what happened in 1816 when he was heading back to be charged with the, with the, for the, his involvement in the Battle of Seven Oaks, where he actually almost drowned in a canoe that killed the agent Kenneth McKenzie, who he forced out of the proprietorship. Um, they had to resuscitate him. And he had ailments for the rest of his life. So in the final days, he was complaining about that as well as the injustices done to him. But he still was happy to be there. So for a family life, we know that Dr. John McLaughlin uh, married Margaret McLaughlin um, in 1811 and then quickly adopts her four children. So very quickly, he has most of a lacrosse team going on very quick. So then we know that there was Joseph McLaughlin, who was born in 1808, 1809, and was mother to an Ojibwe woman. Now, Joseph McLaughlin then goes on uh, to actually do uh, to actually be murdered later on in life in 42 um, by working at a Hudson Bay fort. Um, and he was actually quite distraught about this later on in life, as anyone would be. But it's the way he received the news. It was actually he was murdered by one of his own company men. He was then found not guilty due to lack of evidence. We know that there was Thomas Thomas McKay, uh, born in 1796, who was a clerk within the company, and he actually helped to raise Thomas uh, the best that he could, and he helped to get him some seats within the new company, the Hudson Bay Company. Thomas then moves goes on to actually explore the Snake River Basin over with his, um, south of his father um, in the uh, territory south of Seattle. Then, of course, we have Catherine McKay, who was born in 1801. Uh, then we have Nancy McKay, born in 1802, who the doctor did sign a marriage contract with the, the captain of the cargo vessel, Captain McCargo. I swear I could not make that up if I tried. That's actually his name, Captain McCargo, in charge of the cargo ship. Uh, and they were actually uh, married much later on, uh, but the marriage contract was signed in 1816. 
Um, then, of course, then we have Mary McKay, who was born in 1803, John McLaughlin Jr., born in 1812, Mary Elizabeth, born in 1814. Many of these children, when we're interpreting, were, were at the fort during this time. Then, of course, with Eliza, and then his last son, David, was born in 1821, the year of the merger. Interpreting Dr. John McLaughlin can actually be quite difficult for those of us at Fort William. Some of us like to put a little bit of a humor into him, being the doctor and being in charge. Some people like to be very stern as the doctor, because he is known to have a bit of a temper and be, be very turned. But he is also, on the flip side, in the journal articles, he is known as being very kind, very gentle, and very centered on his family with a good sense of humor. So yeah, we have to flip a coin whenever we do this. I myself like to add a little bit of humor into the doctor, not too much, mind you. Uh, and then I have other people, uh, some of our other interpreters who like to make him very fact-driven and very stern. So we all put our own personal flair on. I like telling stories. Some other people like to tell jokes. So we know that the doctor was of Scottish French heritage. We know that his father was also Irish as well. So I strongly encourage my interpreters, please don't put fake accents on because I don't think that we would get a, a proper accent for the doctor. In 1816, uh, I portray him as uh, being 31 years of age. Now it helps that I have lots of gray hair because the doctor was mostly uh, had mostly white hair by this time. So uh, it's sometimes we have to tell our interpreters to cover up their hair a little bit uh, with the doctor because he's supposed to look like a, um, they described him as the lion. So he had large uh, white hair coming down here, shaved through here. And of course he had his, um, his longer hair. Later in life, he, as a custom in the land, he decided not to cut his hair and he had a very large mane, which was always mentioned in the journal articles. His education, as I said, was of course with Dr. Uh, James Fisher uh, in Montreal. Now, the doctor never actually saw, uh, or actually, sorry, rephrase that, never actually amputated anyone's leg by 1816. But we always uh, tell the good story about how we saw James Fisher doing it twice, but unfortunately no one ever survived. So who wants to try? It's always the next joke that we, that we like to throw in. We know that he was a wintering partner, surgeon, and in charge of the apothecary. So when he first joined the fur trade, he was not allowed to actually act as a doctor. He was a junior clerk within the company. And then during rendezvous, the big rendezvous that happened at Fort William every single year during the late July, early August for two weeks, when the population would actually swell from about 30 to 40 people up to about 1,100 people, um, this is when the doctor was actually tasked to actually do his duties, so he was able to keep his license. Uh, we know uh, he, was, uh, he had very large French uh, Catholic influences, which then would la lead to later in life him marrying Marguerite McLaughlin um, out in Brit what is now British Columbia in a Catholic church. And we know that he also had uh, present uh, aristocratic influences from his grandmother's side. So we know his first involvement was 1803 uh, when he signs his five-year contract with the Northwest Company. He apprenticed only for about 4.5 years before being able to make um, his uh, wintering partner status. And of course, he was only paid 100 pounds during that time, but it helped to put his brother through medical school. Um, in 1816, I let, he's he, the wintering partner, so he lives with his entire very large family in the wintering house, which has about 300 square feet um, in total. And so it's quite tight living, but he, but it was much nicer than what he used to live in when he used to run the, the other posts. And he takes over the proprietorship in the summer of 1815 from Kenneth McKenzie. Kenneth McKenzie was who he had a bit of a rivalry with, and Kenneth McKenzie unfortunately died 1816 with the, when he was in the canoe with the doctor that flipped. Only one canoe flipped during that time, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So afterwards, we know through uh, articles that the doctor went on to establish his farm as well as the sawmill out in the Columbia district. Around the 1840s, we know that many, many new uh, Americans started to settle in that area with controversy between the British government as well as the American government at the time. And the controversy was who actually owned that land. So the doctor was ordered to keep the Americans out of that area by the HBC as well as the British government. The United States eventually gained possession of this area, uh, the Air Oregon Territory, um, and then the, the Great Britain then controlled what now becomes British Columbia. McLaughlin eventually retires in 46. Unfortunately, the American settlers see him as a bit of a British agent or spy, and they actually confiscate his land as money. He did find uh, found this uh, organ, as well as, unfortunately, he does die in 1857. So he, he led a pretty good life for, for the bourgeois. 
generally speaking, the bourgeois, the the upper class, the society, the uh, the Scots in the Northwest Company, they did not really live very long lives. Uh, they 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 a lot of the medicine was very harsh on them. Uh, they drank heavily, um, and the uh, it wasn't the best. Now the Engagé, the Montrealers, lived up into the 60s, 70s, 80s, and sometimes even 90s. From there, they lived a much hardier life. Moving on, the French Canadian, um, and then he's known presently as the father of Oregon. As I mentioned, as Tom mentioned earlier, that uh, as well as with Dale, that he has statues even in the state buildings themselves. Now, interpreting the doctor, uh, a, a bit of an example of this would be, as you can see, I'm currently sitting in my apothecary. The doctor was known for a little, having a little bit of humor. So somebody would come in. So I'm just going to use a. Um, Simon Fraser, who is also another person that I play, is a famous explorer who also worked with the Northwest Company, comes into the apothecary um, to say, or uh, actually uh, comes in with his entire brigade. Doctor, the doctor, myself, oh, excellent. Excellent, Mr. Fraser, you happen to be here. I do have the log books for you to sign. Now, it is very important for you to make sure that we can get the sulfate, uh, copper sulfate onto the feet of your voyageurs, because I do understand that you're heading out as part of your expedition. So we'll sit down just right around, just right around here and make sure that your voyageurs are able to, to soak their feet for as long as they need to, to, to cure that foot rot that happens to be there. Um, um, Mr. Fraser, are, do you happen to know the digestive ailments of your of your voyagers? Oh, yeah, you're saying that the uh, the lied corn and pig fat that the Manger de Lard are eating is not agreeing with you as since you're sitting in the middle of the canoe. Well, then may I please recommend that you actually take five of these cinnamon pills, take three tomorrow, and then come back and tell me if it's actually helping your, your brigade as well. Um, did I tell you what happened to us just the other day, Mr. McKenzie? Oh, sorry, Mr. Fraser, I didn't. Well, Mr. McKenzie and I were sitting in the Great Hall, actually arguing about our status within the Northwest Company, when the strangest thing happened, we were actually sitting there drinking a cup of high wine, when the door burst open and there stood a bear. Yes, Mr. Fraser, a bear. Well, Kenneth McKenzie and I were quite taken back as there was a bear standing at us. He looked at us shyly, walked over to a seat that happens to be right over there, and took a seat next to us. He then reaches over, grabs my cup, grabs my bowl, drinks my drink, and then drinks the broth that I happen to be eating. Well, Kenneth McKenzie and I were quite astounded. And in fact, it was so startling, it stopped the very argument that we happened to be having. Well, Mr. Fraser, I shall tell you what happened next. Miss the bear stood up, walked over towards the door, took out two pistols, fired them in the air, and then ran off. Kenneth and McKenzie and I were quite shocked, believing that nobody would ever believe what happened. And then that is when Kenneth McKenzie realized Angus Bethune wrote about a bear in his very journal that we happen to have over in the back of, of the Great Hall. So we quickly scamper over to actually be able to read what Angus Bassoon had actually read. Angus Bassoon had written about his exploration in Canton, China. So as we quickly flip through the book, we see it. A bear. We're like, yes, that was a bear. It was black and white. Oh, very much. That bear was black and white itself. And we read the description. Each shoots and leaves. <laughs> Capital joke, Mr. Fraser. So the doctor, bit of a dry wet when we do it. This and integrating our stories when we're doing it helped to put a connection not only to our to the people we were with, Kenneth McKenzie. I had a chance to introduce you to Sir Simon Fraser, the ex explorer, but as well as Angus Bethune, Bethune, who's important much later on and much later on in, in the 1821 for his voyages around and establishing trading posts as far away as Canton, China. So we like to think about ourselves as a community. So the community is not just me interpreting uh, Dr. McLaughlin, but it's my connection to the land, my connection to the other people who are here that makes interpreting so much fun with these characters. But next, I'd like to uh, jump into Marguerite McLaughlin, uh, his loving wife of many years. Uh, Margaret McLaughlin, maiden name of Wadden. Um, she was originally born in 1775. Um, she was born um, to a Swiss trader as well as a uh, Cree woman. So she grew up with a foot in both worlds. So she was in, self, in, in herself a, a Métis person. Um, from there, she unfortunately in 1702, she witnessed the murder of her father um, at Lac, de la, Lac de la Rouge by the famous, uh, ex, uh, famous Northwester, Peter Pond. 
Peter Pond was a Northwester for most of his life. And then he, uh, he was actually tried twice for murder. And uh, it was pretty much, they know he did it, but there wasn't enough, enough evidence to actually prove this. So he got away with murder twice. Unfortunately, one of the, one of the people actually happened to be uh, Mar uh, Margaret's father. So this scarred her for a while and she traveled around with her mother. And then she marries uh in 93 she marries alexander mckay now alexander mckay and them actually have a son named thomas who uh as i mentioned uh earlier goes on to actually be an explorer on the west coast and he actually led some of the explorations down to uh what's now california and some of the first trading routes down there um her daughter catherine is born in 1801 and then of course in 1802 nancy is born so as you can see she has quite a few children Oops, that is not the button I meant to hit. Sorry about that. Mary is born at this time. So unfortunately, in 1810, they, uh, their marriage becomes unsustainable, and McKay casts her off. So just to say, that's it, we're done. I'm going to take the oldest son um, with me, Thomas, and I'm going to head out to the West Coast um, because he had retired from the Northwest, sorry, he had retired from the fur trade during this time. But he is convinced by uh, John Jacob Astor of the John Jacob Astor Pacific Fur Trading Company to join up with him. So he takes up, actually uh, shares within the company, heads out to uh, Fort Astoria, which I've mentioned earlier, which is connected to the doctor, and then and boards the Tonquin. But he decides at the last minute to take the Tonquin, which is a sailing ship, and leave his son Thomas behind. Thomas uh, stays in Fort Astoria while his father, Alexander, heads up to trade up there. Now, unfortunately, um, during the Nanaku uh, area, um, it is actually unfortunately attacked by the indigenous people up there. There was unafraid fur trading uh, practices what happened. Another group had actually gone through and actually killed a couple of people. They thought they were the same group of traders. So when they pulled up, they, uh, the indigenous people of the area came on board um, and they thought they were going to be trading with them. And they actually attacked, killed the entire crew. And one of the crew actually set off the powder magazine, ex destroying the entire ship. So Alexander McKay is dead in 1816, abandoning their son Thomas in Fort Astoria. Now, can, now luckily for him, Dr. John McLaughlin comes on in 1811 and actually uh, pays to have Thomas ship, uh, brought back over land with the brigades so that he could actually be with his mother, Marguerite McLaughlin. In 1812, John McLaughlin is born. So then, of course, in 1814, Eliza is born. Uh, 1816, Margaret uh, stays at Fort William while her husband is arrested by Lord Selkirk to, and heads down to Montreal to stand trial for the Battle or Massacre of Seven Oaks, depending on which side of the story that you happen to follow. Then, after the, the trials, John McLaughlin comes back, and in 1817, uh, Liza is born. Uh, in 1821, after the merger, when the doctor comes back after being away for quite some time, uh, that leads to David being born. And then, of course, the doctor takes over the proprietorship and is in charge of the department uh, of Lac de Pluie and then moves back over to Rainy River House, where then in 1821, he meets Stephen Long, um, Stephen Harmon Long, as well as John Tanner. So I keep looking at a page. I had to write that down because I kept confusing the two. Uh, and then, of course, in 1824, he moves to the Columbia Department. Sorry, they moved to the Columbia Department. And then he marries John McLaughlin in the church. Now, interesting story about the church. Remember how I mentioned um, that there were, he, he defended her honor quite fer uh, ferociously? Well, when they got married in 1842 out in the, Paci um, the Pacific, um, the, the priest at the time, because they'd been married for roughly 30 some odd years, turns the, doc turns the doctor and actually says, well, now you were truly married. And then she is no longer um, a uh, woman of ill dispute. So the doctor took this as quite offense to, to his wife and actually punched the priest out right after he was officially married to them. So the doctor was very fond of Marguerite and very ferociously defended her honor and, and, and actually up and held the Métis as well as the Indigenous people in very high esteem. Um, and so that's always kind of one of the, one of the, the, the fun antidotes we have of the doctor. Um, if it wasn't for Marguerite, I'm pretty sure he would have done some more serious things, but Marguerite was known for taming the lion. Uh, so she kept him in good order. Um, through in 46 
Dr. John McLaughlin retires from the fur trade to take up residence in Oregon. Uh, unfortunately, the, her husband dies after many years in uh, 57 and in 18, three years later in 1860, Margaret passes away peacefully and her last will and testament, she is married next to her love of her life, uh, Dr. John McLaughlin, where they still rest today. So Margaret McLaughlin, um, so she has many children, basically an entire lacrosse uh, league, because she could say, play a good game of the Gataway. Um, so Thomas was later, uh, so as we know, uh, in 96, Thomas uh, was, um, was born, we know in 1801, Catherine was born, and then she marries John Alfred O'Garman in 1823, Nancy who was born in 1802 as uh, betrothed basically to Captain Robert McCargo, who was the cargo captain of the, um, of within the Northwest Company, but she actually doesn't marry until she's the age of 21. Uh, 1803, uh, Mary, who's married to uh, Donald McKenzie in 1816, then marries Chief Trader Sinclair of the Hudson Bay Company in 23. And then with her children from McLaughlin, we know that in 1812, uh, her son, John, uh, junior uh, actually dies in 1842 as a trader within the company. Um, he is actually stabbed to death by uh, one of the people working for him at, within the Hudson Bay Company. Eliza, um, then we know that we have um, all the way to David. Now, not much is known about David, um, although he is assumed that he, he is educated and actually goes on to be uh, to be a trader within the companies. So. I spent a lot of time uh, work uh, like providing the information to a lot of our interpreters and interpreting Margaret McLaughlin can actually be quite tricky because you really need to have your foot in both worlds. Um, at Fort William Historical Park, we're really lucky to be working uh, with those in our Indigenous life, Indigenous, indigenous heritage area, led by Elliot Camarati uh, with Maria, as well as uh, John Walmark. Uh, they do a fantastic job, uh, and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of interpreting cues that they actually give us when we're training our students to be able to work with Margaret. Um, all three of them are... Um, are, are from uh, are indigenous themselves, and they and they give a, and we're quite honored to be able to work with them. So uh, we know that uh, Margaret one was born in 1775. So we always say that you know like portray yourself that you were happy to be about 41, 42 at this time. We know that she is Cree as well as Swiss. Uh, so we know that she does speak Cree. Um, so we uh, as well as uh, as well as several French, and at the same time. Um, within the actual household itself. We know that there are Tikanogans as well as trade blankets. So there's a nice mixture of, um, of uh, items from the land as well as uh, from her heritage, as well as items that were trade items within the actual company itself. And we know that uh, she is described as a very strong-willed woman. So she uh, actually kind of really ran the fort the doctor wasn't around. She was known for going out and making sure that the engage are working as well as making sure that things were done right around the fort. Interpreting as the McLaughlins, can, as I mentioned before, can be a little tricky, but uh, gathering the children around and telling a story as a great family man is a good way to put the to put Dr. John McLaughlin in perspective. So I like to gather people around who are, who are around and, and tell stories that he might be telling his children at the time. So gather around, lads. Actually, I should say I'll do this as Dr. John McLaughlin um, with my hat on. Gather around, lads and lasses, gather around. Well, it is nighttime and it's time for me to tell you a bit of a story. Well, Marguerite is away, so I will tell you this bedtime story, and hopefully you remember some things about it. So have you ever heard the story about the rabbit and the skunk? Tom, have you ever heard the story about the rabbit and the skunk? No, I see Tom shaking his head there. Well, the rabbit and the skunk happened a long time ago. Rabbit, as you know, are, are quite fearful little animals and they jump around, but they do taste good to eat. Rabbit turned to his father one day and said, Father, I have to walk home soon. And I'm fearful of, about me, meeting my Ingen in out in the bush and him eating. Me. The father said, well, if you're not sure, because there's no moon tomorrow night, what I want you to do is you're going to feel the facial features of the animal that you happen to meet. And that it will tell you who it happens to be. So with this, little rabbit wasn't as scared. So the next night, true enough, there was no moon. And as little rabbit is hopping home to go see his father, he runs into another animal and he yells out, who's there? Well, he actually ran into skunk and skunk goes, well, is, well, I'm here, who's there? Rabbit was like, oh, I'm not sure if that you were a wolf. So I, I'm not gonna tell you who I am. So skunk goes, well, then how do we know who we are? Rabbit had an idea. Ah, my father told me 
what to do. So why don't we come over and we'll feel each other's facial features and we'll see if we can guess who each other are. And so Skunk goes, well, this sounds like a good idea. So Rabbit go, so Skunk goes, can I go first? Very timidly. So Rabbit said, yes. So Skunk comes over, feels long hair, long hair, long floppy ears, big feet. <gasps> you must be Rabbit, Skunk says. Well, lo and behold, Rabbit said, you are right. So now it's my turn. Skunk said, okay, you should guess me pretty easy. So Skunk comes over and goes, sharp nose, tiny ears, rubbing his little paws along the hair. He goes, greasy hair, <gasps> you must be a voyageur. Well, to this day, Skunk has never talked to Rabbit again. Well, I got Tom to laugh, so I'm happy with that one. So the doctor was known for telling many of these stories, and we try to incorporate them into our interpretations as well. So uh, are there any questions about the McLaughlins? I, I have about enough time to take two quick questions before I move on. It's kind of a bit of a mental break, because I know I have about 20 minutes left before I get the, the shepherd's hook to take me off the stage. We don't have anybody that has put a question in the chat, so you can still put a question there, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question, this would be a great chance to do that. I see some typing. Yep, there is a question in the chat right now. David, wasn't an engraved plate with the McLaughlin's name found in the 1990s in a garden at a home where the post was originally? I actually haven't heard about that one. Um, um, maybe the uh, Michael from the Thunder Bay Museum may have heard about this. I know that we did find a lot of artifacts during the 68 to 72, uh, the dig that I'll be talking about later. And we have another question about uh, ongoing education. Did the doctor do ongoing education to improve his skills or just learn more? So the doctor actually learned a lot about indigenous medicines from his wife, Margaret, at the time. And then as the medicine styles changed, because he had learned out of the humoral theory, he did have to upkeep his skills as he went on. So he did do some and he did do a few rotations or as they would call going down where he'd actually go back to Montreal, where he did have to prove his skills as well. All right. Well, one last oh, question for you. Okay. Um, Margaret's father, who was that? It was, and I have it written down in front of me and I can't find it right now. Uh, there's the many different names. Uh, I believe it was Etienne. It says, uh, I will come back. I will, I'll be able to answer this at the end. I have it written down. I'll just have to go find it. David, there's a, maybe a uh, hint. It, was it the Swiss pro, um, protest uh, trader? Yes. Okay. And I guess that's probably from someone I work with who's trying to give me a hand. So thanks to the guys I work with and the ladies. Okay, so uh, the Hudson Bay Company uh, versus the Northwest Company, just to quickly define the differences between the two companies, so that the 1821 merger makes a little bit more sense. The Hudson Bay Company um, was mainly based in, in England, and it had a shipping facility located on the Hudson Bay, rarely bargained um, uh, with the indigenous population did not trade alcohol, which is very important, and did not promote uh, marriage à la façon de pays with them. They, they actually had a strict no marrying policy and only London directors could share within the profits. And they used mainly York boats to get the, their goods back and forth. To make a decision within the company, it took roughly one to two years for this to happen because they were based out of London, England. Now, the Northwest Company uh, was based in Montreal, and it had a, its inland headquarters was based at, Willi at Fort Williams. This allowed them to make decisions during the middle of the, of the winter as well. With an express canoe, they could go from Montreal all the way to Fort William, which was 200, sorry, uh, roughly about 2,000 miles uh, in 13 days via canoe. Now, it is also said that the, the last time that that happened in 18. 12 to actually notify everyone that the war of 1812 was starting that actually um, the voyagers looked like death so this didn't happen too often but it could be done 
Now, they were open to bargaining because they knew that this was something that they had over the Hudson Bay Company. They did trade alcohol. In fact, they traded mainly high wine at the time, which was then dilute, which was a diluted um, substance, which then they could go to about six times, six parts water to one part high wine. And so if they brought in about 600,000 liters of this or in, in one year, then times that by six, it's a lot of alcohol that they were trading and giving away. They encouraged uh, mayors out of the fast loan to pays, and they also provided money for the families as well. This was stopping in about 1815 because the burden on the company itself was get, was getting too much in debt load because they had lots of families that were out there that the company was basically paying a stipend to every year. And then, of course, the wintering partners and the agents could share within the profits. Unfortunately, within the company, Mr. McTavish was its founder. And then through nepotism, his, his uh, nephew, Simon and William, got it and all the higher positions were filled with rent, uh, family so there's lots of nepotism within the company which made it unfair for the wintering partners and harder for them to move up so with that being said the 1821 merger came along now i like to th find that what is that one item that you think that may have actually you could go back to in time and say this probably helped to lead to the 1821 merger. I had to rock my head about this. Uh, so I actually looked back and I said, well, what was the one thing that connected a couple of the major players together? And it was actually Voyages. Voyages was written by Sir Alexander Mackenzie, or the Emperor, as they called him. Um, and this led to his connection with Lord Selkirk, which then led to the Red River Colony and the Battle of Seven Oaks. It has the, one of the longest names I know, voyages from Montreal on the River St. Lawrence through the continent of North America to the frozen and Pacific Oceans. So it's a journal of his, um, of his travels as he explored. Now, he did actually have a bit of rivalry with Simon Fraser, somebody I get to actually portray, and he did turn around and actually na they named uh, rivers after each other. Sir so, uh, Alexander Mackenzie, he was born in 67 and actually passed away in 1820, right before the merger. He was known as the emperor. He owned shares within the Northwest Company, which he then later um, actually sold. He did actually, uh, he was the first European to cross North America, north of Mexico in 1793, which predated the Lewis and Clark expeditions by 12 years. He then later became a, um, um, a member within the North, sorry, the Hudson Bay Company with Lord Selkirk, um, after uh, who got interested in the fur trade by reading his book, Voyages. The Thomas Douglas, the fifth Earl of uh, Selkirk, 1771 to 1820, was a Scottish philanthropist. He was bringing, he, he felt that he really needed help this, the, his fellow Scotsmen out because their land was being taken away through a land Re reclamation act. So he was actually bringing crofter farmers over and creating um, colonies in Upper Canada as well as Prince Edward Island. Then he read Voyages and got very interested with Alexander Mackenzie in the fur trade. He actually joined a beaver club um, during the winter of uh, in Montreal, which is a, a joining of the members of the Northwest Company to learn about more about the Northwest Company. He actually went under the guise of wanting to join the company, but then later actually used that just to figure out how the whole system worked. And then he actually, with Alexander Mackenzie, bought shares within the Hudson Bay Company uh, to get the land, um, which is now called the Assiniboine, and then the, he was able to create a colony there. So a little bit of skullduggery while he was there, and a little bit of um, you know James bonding it while while he was trying to figure out how to get the land. So this is the area that he was actually allotted through the Hudson Bay. There's Fort William, and this is roughly about the area of the colony. So as you can see, it is about five times the size of Scotland. So that's quite, you know, like if he's from Scotland, that's quite the, the track of land that he has there. So while he was setting up his, uh, after reading the book and he was starting his, uh, the setup after reading Voyages, he meets Miles McDonnell, who then he promotes to the governor of the Cinnaboy. Miles McDonnell plays a very vital role in this because he was the one who drafted the Pemmican Proclamation in 1814, which basically stopped all the pemmican, which is dried meat, which has been pounded into a powder mixed with bear fat and berries, which is the driving force of the voyageurs, uh, from going east to west. It basically stopped the Northwest Company. And uh, he also issues in the same year a proclamation saying that the Métis, who were buffalo hunters, were not allowed to run buffalo on horses, effectively grounding the Métis. This caused quite the amount of friction in that area. And he, he actually caused so much issues, he was actually forced to resign his governorship in 1815. 
Then Robert Semple comes along. Robert Semple, he was a territorial government uh, under the Hudson Bay Company. He arrives in 1815, but he keeps those two proclamations and forced to starve out the Northwest Company. In, a, in June 11th, he, is, he then orders the demolition of Fort Gibraltar, effectively enforcing that the Northwest Company shall never come back. The Métis lost their main trading partners, and no pemmican was flowing back and forth. This is really a, a quick Cole's notes of a much lar larger talk, and I don't want to steal from Michael from the Thunder Bay Museum. This raises tension within the Métis, and he leaves the settlement on June 19th in 1816 um, to stop the Northwest Company from gathering vital supplies to keep their business running. Um, and it was all done by Cuthbert Grant. He was sent up and Cuthbert Grant was actually a clerk within the Northwest Company. Semple then takes his force of settlers out to, to arrest the Northwest force led by Cuthbert Grant, who was then who was tasked by the Northwest Company to get these items going. There was an argument that ensued. Governor Semple had a piece of paper, held it up, read this big proclamation saying he had the power to arrest Grant and the other Northwesters. Well, Someone fired, and through uh, court proceedings, they were able to determine that actually the settlers fired first. Um, they fired at the Métis. The Métis dropped behind their horses as they were trained to do as skilled sharp shooters with the buffalo. There was three exchanges of fire, mostly uh, with the Métis, and Governor Semple and 20 other settlers were killed. There was only one survivor. And then at that point, the settlement then surrenders to Grant and the Métis. That leads Fort Will, uh, Fort Will very, very vulnerable because upon hearing this, Lord Selkirk, who's now on his way up to go see his colony, hears that the colony basically has been sacked. Governor Semple is dead and many of the settl settlers have died. So then he hires a disbanded uh, force of Demiron soldiers who were left over from the War of 1812, who were Swiss, and they head up, about 90 of them in three cannon, head up to seize and arrest everybody in Fort William. On August 13th, Fort William is then occupied by Lord Selkirk. I would have to say, even though Canada doesn't exist, this was the quintessential Canadian siege. Imagine looking outside your, your palisade and you see 90 red coat Demiron soldiers with, with brown vests pointed at you, three cannon and a couple York boats, and you're staring this down. You are a... Um, you are just basically an engagé. You are a French Canadian fur trader. You look over these partners who own all the wealth are basically saying, you must go fight for the, our honor and the honor of the company. Well, the voyagers basically said, that's not happening. You're not paying us enough. They're trained soldiers and that cannon will blow a hole through this palisade because we're a trading post, not a military foe post so basically once the partners decide to say somebody needs to close the door this is the the quintessential canadian part someone stuck their arm in the door and that's the only bloodshed that actually happened through the entire siege lord selker comes in occupies the the fort arrests many many of the partners so we have uh, wintering partners so kenneth mckenzie william mcgovery and of course dr john mclaughlin uh who's the tie that bides everything through this entire story now, with the HBC in control, Lord Selkirk then takes all the wintering partners and they head down to Montreal to face charges. Um, en route just outside Sault Ste. Marie, that's when the canoe flips killing Kenneth McKenzie, almost drowning Dr. John McLaughlin. And we play that as part of our interpretations with him as he goes later on in life. Between 1816 and 1820, the court cases were many. Starting off, Lord Selkirk did not actually have enough, sorry, have the jurisdictional right to arrest the wintering partners and to, um, to, to occupy the fort. So that was thrown out very quickly. The Northwest Company sued Lord Selkirk as well as the Hudson Bay Company for what they did. Lord Selkirk then conveniently happens to be down in the United States on a bit of a tour. Word gets back that he is now trying to evade his court cases and to defend his honor. That brought, brings him back to the British North America, where he now faces trial. Dr. Jocklin, Dr. John McLaughlin then faces a two-day trial in which he is found innocent in any charges laid against him in the battle or massacre of the Seven Oaks. All, as I said, all charges were dropped, and Northwest companies continue this on for almost four years of these vicious court cases. This results in both companies being virtually bankrupt. And highlighting of the merger, which happened in 1821. Um, so in 1820, Henry Beth uh, Bathurst, who was the Secretary of War and the colonies, basically says, you guys now, now need to stop this. We've had enough of this, your tomfoolery. You've killed people. You burned Fort down. This is going to bankrupt the entire economy, which is basically running off of 
these wonderful things, the beaver top hat and the fur trade. So he orders two companies to stop hostilities and to, to merge at the same time. The Northwest Company agents, so the Montreal agents, as well as the London agent, Simon McGovery, are in London to actually um, to negotiate this um, uh, the merger on behalf of the Northwest Company. Unbeknownst to them, Dr. John McLaughlin heads over with Angus Bethune to negotiate on the side of the wintering partners because the wintering partners felt they were going to basically be left penniless at the end of this. They were kept apart. The Hudson Bay Company realized that they are now negotiating with the split Northwest Company. Upon hearing this, he, he goes out of his way to keep both comp- uh, parties apart within the company. Unfortunately, word gets out to both parties that the other party is there. And at this point, the Hudson Bay Company has to make a decision with who they're going to side with. So they actually side more with Simon McGovery and Ellis. And then in they sign with them in on March 26, 1821. Now, they didn't cut out the wintering partners. In fact, the this, this uh, agreement was actually more beneficial to the wintering partners than they ever could have hoped because they knew how the company ran. So they weren't effectively cut out. The agents were basically paid off and basically told, that's it, you, you know, you're done. Um, and they took small, you know, pennies on the share, whereas the wintering partners were able to get shares within the Hudson Bay Company. And many of them, including the doctor, went on to be a uh, chief factors within the company. Dr. John McLaughlin, of course, unfortunately, having been told this, he now has to head back with Angus Bassoon. He goes to Fort William Historical, sorry, Fort William, uh, to, to inform them that the company no longer exists and they are now owned by the Hudson Bay Company. And that poor soul, Angus Bassoon, has to paddle across the continent and tell every single fort, uh, sorry, every single Northwest Company fort that the company doesn't exist. I would have hated to have been that individual at that time. Could you imagine the response that he would have gotten going across? I see Tom shaking his head like this. So yes, we we always talk about that. Uh, But how do we know all this information? Uh, Well, it's from the Gene Morrison uh, Canadian Fur Trade uh, Company. So from, uh, from 1975 until 1990, Jean Morrison was a wonderful lady. She actually started the library at Fort William Historical Park. And it's with all of her, through her dedication, that we were able to, to find out what we have here. And we still continue our tradition of continuing education and research gathering to the best of our abilities. And hopefully we can still do we're proud. So within our collections, we have the, you know, the largest fur trade collection as well, you know, for universities as well as central sites uh, of materials in central Canada, as well as the upper Canada. We have collections of archives, we have artifacts, we have reports from the archaeological dig. Um, we, you know, as you look over here, we have minutes from uh, McLaughlin's letters from when he happened to be um, in charge of the Pacific District. Uh, district, as well as maps, pictures, contracts, and we have much more. More, I could actually give a much longer conversation on what we have, but uh, the best way to say is contact us at Fort William Historical Park, and we can definitely uh, make arrangements once COVID's uh, a little farther down in the history books, and we can get people here, and you can explore uh, some of the wonderful people that we had um, who were occup- who were basically running the fort in 1816. Now, as I mentioned before, we did do an archaeological project because Fort William Historical Park is not on the original location of Fort William. Fort William was originally about 13 to 14 miles downriver. Uh, it's now currently under a CN rail yard. A little hard to make a, a historic fort in that location. So we were actually on Point de Miron, which is connected to the 1821 uh, C, uh, sorry, 1816 siege, where Lord Selkirk came to the Hudson Bay Post and actually encamped with his de Miron soldiers before going to siege the fort. So between 67 and, and 72, Lakehead University and the MNR came and they uh, dug in between and around all the different uh, rail lines and they were actually finding quite a bit of findings. My favorite map is this one. I wanted to bring this one up to show everyone because and I'm just going to show where's my laser pointer. So as you can see here we have Fort William is in in the red right here and this is pretty much how we are laid out ourselves Uh, and the CN rail yards. This is on the east end, end of Thunder Bay formerly Fort William. Um, and then as you can see here, the Great Hall is right here, the canoe sheds. So anything past about this point right here, these are all built into the foundation of, of some of the houses. And many of the streets here are named for McTavish, uh, McGilvery, and they actually give namesake to the original Fort William. The last building standing was this one right here, which is the stone source, which actually lasts until about the 1860s. So they actually allowed them to actually dig. So here's our stores, our outfits. Uh, this is the, uh, the Northwest House. 
where the, uh, the company's gentlemen resided uh, and many more areas. So um, if we go back one, you'll see the, the stone in the bottom corner. Um, that was one of the few stone buildings that would have been there. So the only few still uh, stone buildings, of course, would have been the stone stores as well as the powder magazine. So Fort William Historical Park, we offer uh, quite a bit of different programming. We do educational programming, we do virtual programming, in-person programming. We have a living farm, we have a full living history program as well. Um, and we are very honored to work with those uh, in many different areas and we have many different partners from the Sunday Bay Museum to uh, our partnerships with Science North. Um, we do hands-on learning experience and many of us dress up as Dr. John McLaughlin or Angus Bethune or, or Jean-Baptiste Cadeau or, or Basil Lafour, whoever we happen to be that day. Some days, you know, we do wear many different hats and we're very honored to work there and be able to do the skills that we do from the trades as well as um, to building um, to building wigwams uh, and working um, with basically revitalizing our indigenous encampment to highlight as well as honor and showcase the indigenous heritage of this land. So there's more to explore uh, from everything from firing a musket as this lady is uh, doing up top to going in and doing education programming such as life in a wigwam, in a wigwam uh, as well as um, doing anything from just going on a tour itself. There's more to explore at Fort William Historical Park if you'd like to know more. Uh, you can contact me uh, through Fort William Historical Park, so fwhp.ca, um, and uh, you can chat with them. And we're always uh, excited to work on different programs and to come in and give uh, to talks with us. And I'm very honored to have been here. Uh, thank you, Dale and Tom, for reaching out to me. Uh, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Are there any questions? Thank you so much. There are some questions. Um, what kind of injuries did the doctor attend to as, as a doctor to the employees? A lot of them were crushing injuries. Uh, that would have been from 90 pound fur packs falling on people, trees. Um, there could have been the occasional musket ball being shot at people. Um, and a lot of it was actually, uh, I would say a vast majority was probably intestinal problems uh, with people uh, basically eating uncooked food, uh, worms, things, uh, things along that. So a lot of it was, how do I get things in? And how to, then very quickly, how do I get things out of people at the same time? That's great. Um, could you tell us what a Swiss protest trader is? Swiss protest trader. Uh, so they were working with the French fur trade at the time. Uh, came over, uh, so French back, uh, Swiss background, uh, basically working independently. Great. Can you define the XY company term in history? So the XY company was the original term uh, before the Northwest Company started. Uh, started originally with... Uh, it's falling off. Started originally with Mr. McTavish. Uh, then there was the XY company, which was started. Then originally starting with uh, portraying a lot of alcohol to the uh, Americans and then basically went into the fur trade. He then signed up with the Foybishers um, when that created the Northwest Company. The XY company comes back into play when McGilvery and McKenzie actually uh, split ways with McTavish to create the new Northwest Company. And then they were actually come back to merge several years later. Great. Uh, it looks like we have another question. What was the go-to medication that the doctor would always carry on, carry on him? Cinnamon pills. Because most of the time it was upset stomachs and people uh, with a lot of flatulence from eating light corn and pig fat. Wild. Um, looks like that's all the questions we have in the chat. I, would I have a question. Yep, yeah, perfect. Uh, oh, Bill Hennessy here. Well, uh, David, uh, after uh, Fort William was uh, attacked by... Uh, the Hudson Bay people, uh, from that point in 1816 until 1821, uh, what do you think was going on at Fort William? I, it's like a blank page to me. Well, Fort William during that time uh, was still operating as the inland headquarters. There was a lot of worry. Um, so Lord Selkirk, when he left, actually left a regiment of Demiron soldiers there. So they actually stayed. They were still looking for evidence. The Hudson Bay Company officially controlled the fort. Um, when the Hudson Bay Company lost their lawsuits and they were countersued by the Northwest Company, Lord Selkirk was actually ordered to leave um, Fort William. And then Northwest Company retook control of Fort William. At that point, their main focus was on actually getting the fur trade up and running. So it acted mainly just as a uh, the inland headquarters again. So they were making decisions on what was happening, uh, but trying, but they were watching the news intently as to what was coming out of, um, what was actually coming out of the, um, 
Montreal lawsuits, and they were actually quite shocked uh, when the doctor returned saying that they in 1821 that they were actually forced to merge. Great, I encourage other people to unmute. This is a great time to ask your questions, or you can still type them into the chat. I got a little follow up question. Uh, sure. Well, in 1816, uh, how, what what time, what would be the time frame? Do you suppose before uh, the Northwest Company could continue operating out of Fort William? The so everything happened very quickly afterwards because they were taking down during the summertime. Uh, express canoes would have been sent out with news of the preceding uh, court case, but they're actually run effectively by the under the guidance of the Hudson Bay Company for at least a year. Okay. Thank Hopefully you. that helps. Yeah. <laughs> we spent a lot of time focusing on you know, the, the 1816, the lead up in the, in the Pemmican Wars during that time frame, uh, And then afterwards, the uh, a lot of the documentation that we have actually refers back to the court cases and then the merger. And uh, with what we do is we focus a lot on the daily life of what people would have been doing. So build, making the fur packs, building canoes, um, which we still do today, um, as well as uh, looking at just continuing uh, their alliances with the Indigenous people of the land. Thank you. Looks like we have some people unmuting. Feel free. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I um, in reading Rainy Lake House, um, the Falcon and Daniel Harmon's uh, diaries. I'm astounded at the distances that these uh, men would and women would take uh, to visit each other in the winter when they were bored. Um, covering 20, 30, 40 miles sometimes, it seems, in a day. And they would do this for like a week in the winter. How would they travel um, overland and survive these winters, the nights? Would they have tents? Would they be, have uh, four or five laborers with them? Would they be dragging sleds with dogs? Any insight into those travels would sound so difficult, and yet they, they take them on a lark like no big deal. Uh, you're right. They were very difficult journeys. A lot of snowshoeing, uh, dog sledding during the winter time, and then of course, as you're having, heading west of Fort William, they weren't in the uh, Montreal canoes or the Master canoes. They were actually in the North canoes, uh, which were which ranged from about 22 to 26 feet versus the Montreal canoes, which were about 36. But they did carry tents with them. They did take some provisions with them, and they and they never traveled alone. They always traveled with a uh, party of engagés. The French voyageurs. So if you're heading out west, or these gentlemen would have had the Habernance or the wintering voyageurs, or the men of the north, and uh, they would go, they'd take all the provisions, they would snowshoe. In fact, actually got to the point, it was so hard, these travels, even though that in their journals, they just write it off as, oh, I just, I traveled for three weeks to go visit Angus Bethune in this post, where in fact, it was very, very rough going. Sometimes they ran out of food. Uh, they actually, there's many stories of them eating their own, very own moccasins while they're traveling and boiling their boots. Um, but they relied heavily on their alliances with the indigenous population to keep them alive. They knew where the different groups were in the different, in the, and they would actually travel specifically hitting them so that they could try to restock their food or at least try, you know, get a guide to be able to help them at the same time. Remember how I mentioned that the doctor almost drowned? Well, in fact, that stopped him from doing several trips because he would have bouts, uh, from afterwards from the water being in his lungs and medical, medical conditions that he had, that actually stopped him from doing quite a bit of traveling because it was just too hard for him. Wonderful. Well, one last question, and that is, uh, have you found any journal references to the doctor's work on Little Vermilion Lake near Crane Lake? Um, I personally have not, but uh, I'm pretty sure that we have some of that uh, within the archives, or at least uh, if you were to send us an email at fwhp.ca, we can definitely see you in the right direction with our collections manager, uh, Sean Patterson, Kim, we can definitely help help you steer you in the right direction. Well, thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. I think we all learned a little bit more and i um, excited to talk about this more throughout the day. I hope you can hang out a little bit just in case somebody has a little question during break, but otherwise I invite you all to take a break. We will see you back here at 1045. Um, otherwise, you can chat away amongst your group if you'd like while we wait. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thanks, David.